Hello and welcome to the Gang Culture Podcast, a series educating you about gang culture. Whether you're listening at home, school, or on the way to work, we hope you can enjoy listening and learn something to share with others. You're listening to Gang Culture right now. We're very happy to be broadcasting our first live episode of Gang Culture, our podcast out of Wilmington, Delaware. Tonight, we have a really special guest. It's someone that you've all become quite familiar with. We get to turn the microphone on the other side to our host, Orlando Foreman, as well as bringing back three of our former guests from this season. Tonight, we're gonna be asking some wrap-up questions as we celebrate our first season. We have had 10 episodes so far in our pilot, and uh, if you're listening from home, you must, have, you must like it so far if you're here on the 10th episode. Uh, but let's go ahead and we're gonna start with just celebrating the fact that this has been a great journey, and we wanna give some thank yous uh, right off the bat. First of all, we have to thank Mr. Dennis Finicairo, and he actually is the person who wrote the grant to get gang culture funded. So thank you very much, Dennis. And if you're you're listening from home, there is clapping with our live studio audience here. Uh, We have our producer, Miss Darby, over here on camera one. Uh, She is the person who put the whole show together. Uh, Our editor is Lewis. Uh, so he is behind the steam back there. Thank you, Lewis. Uh, of course, our host, Orlando Foreman. Thank you so much for doing all of that. Uh, and then, great special thanks. If you're not aware, Gang Culture is a podcast that is created with youth producers uh, who are all under the age of, I believe, 19, uh, maybe even 18, and as young as 12. Uh, But they have been behind the scenes at all of these episodes, filming, editing, uh, and right now I'm looking at a a whole crew of youth in this room. Uh, So thank you all for being producers and also for for being so great in this show. Thanks. Let's give a shout out to them. All right. And we do have just a special guest in our audience who uh, I just wanted to shout out, Officer Hudson. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, Officer Hudson was in our podcast earlier. Uh, and if you haven't already, make sure you go back and listen, hear interviews with Jason Pyers and Dr. Yasser Payne and uh, Aaron Kupchak. And of course, we have an episode that is all youth focused where we ask the youth questions and you got to check out that one from the Cause Production crew. But let's dive in right now to the actual people that we have here in our studio audience. I'm going to introduce them. Uh, of course, you have met before online, uh, if you've been listening, Orlando Foreman, who uh, works at Network Connect and has been our host here at the podcast, uh, is just a community developer, a, a community champion, mentor to many, and thank you so much for being thank with you. us tonight. Thank you. We have another friend of mine, Mr. Damon Warren. Damon is the educator from Philadelphia and is the founder of the Peace Initiative, which stands for Please Educate All Children Equally. Uh, he's a big time advocate for you know, justice, I would say, uh, and social justice all, all around. He's also here in the Wilmington area uh, doing some work with youth. Uh, we have another friend of mine, uh, Mr. Ellis Rouse, who is a community educator. Uh, and he brings some firsthand insight. Uh, if you listen to his episode, you know that he is also a member of the Bloods, uh, who was uh, back in Brooklyn. Uh, and then we also have Miss Diane Moss, who is uh, currently uh, at the Howard High School. I met her uh, because one of our youth producers kept raving about their favorite teacher who really believed in them and thought that uh, she should be connected to this, uh, the cause and the podcast and, and all of this. But uh, we want to thank you for coming because you also you brought a whole class of students here to, to learn about uh, broadcasting. So thanks, Miss Moss. That's our panel right now. And again, I'm Scott Michaels. I'm the CEO of The Cause. And this is my first time hosting, so please bear with me as we get started. Uh, I do want to start before we get into some of these questions for the whole panel. I want to talk to you for a moment, Orlando. Uh, I believe this was your first podcast. Uh, what was it like sitting in the other side of the seat uh, and discussing something you know, as vital and important as gangs and gang culture? Well, for me, this was my first podcast as well. Um, but it was just like having a conversation. And so I, I didn't know what to expect. But as each episode, each guest that I was able to talk to, 
it just became very familiar. Um, the guests actually made it easy to interview, and that was a blessing. Um, and as time went on, it just seemed to connect together and come together. And uh, it just was a beautiful experience to share a little bit of myself and then share the things that we were trying to share with the youth. And um, it was just a beautiful experience. Uh, as someone who was, I wasn't here for all of the tapings, but I was here for a few of them. Uh, there, there really was, like a, a general vibe would be created in these filmings. Uh, it would start, I think, with you and the guest, but then also some of the producers. And it, it would just usually be a kind of an energy in the room uh, during this podcast. Is there anything that you took away from doing this work, you know, maybe an insight that you had or something you hadn't thought about before? I think if there was anything that I took away, it was the ability of multiple people to work together for this one cause. And so when you watch the different personalities, the different professionals, the different people behind the scenes, um, the great job that Darby did, um, it was just easy to see how we were on the same page. And I think if we all become a little bit more humble with ourselves and work together, we could just make this world that much better. And so when you saw the collection, and, and, and not just that, when I think about the job the youth did of, with the cause of their time and being here and filming and learning and listening and participating, this is what it was about because it wasn't just the old people, it was the young, intertwining with the older. And so for me, it was just a beautiful experience of getting information out. And the one thing about social media, you never know who hears you. You never know who you affect. And so as I started watching the episodes, as I listened to the different panelists and things of that nature, I saw the strength in what we were doing. And we don't even know how great this can be. And that's the beautiful part. That's what I took from it. Well, I, I, I want to thank you for, for pointing that out. Um, I think that was somewhat intentionally in the design of the program of the guests, but here at The Cause, which stands for Collective Action, you know, Together in Action, Urging Social Evolution, the idea is that we all do have a role, and everyone's role is, you, you don't have to go outside who you are to be someone who can help in any of these situations. Uh, right on this panel, we have educators, police officers, uh, community members in the audience we have uh, uh, I'm looking at a boxing instructor who owns a gym uh, and he himself is doing his own role because he has a program called gloves against drugs that's Mike Miller with Delaware uh, fight factory thanks for being in the audience uh, that's right um, but just to point it out you know if you can if you could take your passion of boxing and use that to help the community um, give a place for a former gang member uh, maybe to, to have a respite or, or it, it just, I hope, as you said, you never know who's listening on social media. I hope someone right now is thinking about what they do in their life and connecting it to how they can connect with other people to help, whether it's to end gang violence or what other issues are in their lives. So thanks for po pointing that out. But um, I want to thank you again from the bottom of my heart. We've known each other for a little while, but it was amazing watching you. And I think anyone at home can probably agree he has a liquid gold voice when it comes to podcasting. So thanks so much. Thank you. All right. So for, for now what we're going to do is we're just going to open up some panel questions. Um, and these are some questions that we still had that we wanted to know some insights for. So I'll say a question. If you feel that you might have an answer for it, uh, please speak up. But there's no pressure to answer. Uh, and we're just going to dive right in with... Um, in general, what do you think for a person is the biggest risk of being involved in gangs or in gang culture? What's the biggest risk if you were to try to pinpoint one? Uh, go ahead. You want to go? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, and that's uh, Ellis. You're listening to Ellis Rouse. Yeah. Um, obviously, death. Death, loss of freedom, affecting the whole community. There's so many things that, that play into when you um, put yourself in that situation. And um, that's why I enjoy being here to, 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 to share what I've witnessed and what I've been around and what I know. Um, it's part of the reason I do the job that I do in the community as an educator. 
Um, but loss of life is just, you know, that's, that's the animal. That's the animal that comes with gang culture. Yeah, and, and basically to segue into that, it's gener you know becomes generational too. Sometimes when you have that constant um, angst against one another, and then it just goes on and on and on. Um, violence begets violence, unfortunately. Yeah, and perhaps peace begets peace. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I would also like to add, you know, my panelists here, um, definitely eloquently said the two things um, that happen along with their culture, but also it just hurts a community as a whole, right? There is a part of it, and we can talk about that a little bit later, that brings a sort of family, but sometimes we have dysfunctional families as well. I'm not saying it's totally dysfunctional, but those two elements of it does make that part of it dysfunctional, but then it impacts the entire community as well, you know, and it could create a dysfunctional community. It could also impact those individuals that might not be involved in the gang, you know, to harm them as well. So, yeah. And I think one of the biggest things is that we as humans all like to feel accepted, want to be a part of something. Sometimes what we're being a part of might not be the best thing to be a part of, but we don't know that. And so, for my time in dealing with, um, gangs when I was in the West Coast. It was like a, it was a culture because I had met young men who said their mother or father was gang banging. And it amazed me because this was kind of foreign to me and I didn't understand it. And as I started understanding that you have, so we have to understand that we are products of our environment, most of us, the majority of us. And so when you are a product of your environment, you adapt to some things that may not be the greatest things, but you adapt to what you know and what you see. And so for a lot of these young men and young women who don't see the great examples of fatherhood or motherhood or community, they see things, the flash, they see some of the materialistic things, because you gotta understand some of these people are hungry. You have to understand some of these people might be homeless. You may have to understand that some of these people deal with domestic violence and they're trying to escape that in the household. And so their escape, what they think is their escape, they're going to something else, which they think may be a connection to something else where they can just push that to the side for a little bit of time. And so, there, like you said, there are a lot of, lot, a lot of parts to this. And unfortunately, it's just a bad mix in most cases. Because if you look at gangs, the history of gangs, it went back to protection of neighborhoods. Before we put the little intangibles of drug selling or other things into it, that's when it took the turn for the worse. If you look at the Black Panthers, they started the first uh, free lunch program. I don't know a lot of people even know that. Mm -hmm. They were the, the, the instigators of the first free lunch program, right? And what they were trying to do is protect the neighborhoods from the oppression that the police were embarking on the African-American community at the time. And so they tried to protect the, the neighborhoods and then gangs started doing the same thing. But once the elements of drugs and other things became a part of it, the part of the unity part changed a little bit. The dynamics changed and then you had unfortunately the shootings, the killings and a lot of other things that go a part of the gang culture now, which is in 2024. Yeah, shout out to the Black Panther Party because while them starting their free food program, it then inspired schools to do the same. To that point in time, schools didn't have free breakfast programs. The Black Panther Party actually started that and then schools began to do it after them. Yep. Shout out to the Black Panther Party. No doubt. Indeed. You know, one of the things I'm hearing about is that there's the risks are not just individual, it's community. And and that is another thing that we're all about here is that we're we're not a rock. We're all, you know, connected. Uh, and so it, it's very easy now to see, and, and when you're listening back to some of those past episodes, uh, Dr. Yasser Payne uh, specifically talked about the fact that, you know, neighborhoods can be brought down by just a few people uh, who, who are in there, uh, just a couple bad actors, uh, but it could affect a lot. Um, Orlando, you started to go into this, so it, it happens to be our next question is, what factors do you think uh, make youth more vulnerable to join a gang? You were talking about the flashiness yes. and things like that. I would what say else? one of the biggest parts is, is economics. 
as economics plays such a, a vital part in almost all of the negative things that you basically see in a lot of communities eroding economics housing people don't have proper housing what are they doing if people don't have the proper employment what are they doing the proper education what are they doing so when you take all of these things that people take for granted for those who are struggling with now it's their back is against the wall and so what happens when your back is against the wall you go into survival mode and sometimes when you go into survival mode you do some things that's not so nice Anyone else have some insight? Do you think what might lure youth in to the lifestyle? Um, I would like to um, talk about that survival mode um, for myself. Growing up in the 80s and 90s in Brooklyn, New York, it was, it was a crack epidemic. And um, other cultures were coming into my neighborhood and literally taking over because they had crack to sell and making tons of money and my mom my little sister my brother they had to walk past this every day just to get to the train station to go to school so for me I felt like I had to be somewhat of a leader for my family. Like the saying, uh, you can't beat them, join them. I didn't join the drug dealers, I joined the Bloods because they were the only group in the neighborhood that the drug dealers respected. So it was survival mode. It was, it was very much survival mode. Um, now when I was a part of the gang, I realized that I could play a huge role because I was coming in with a different mindset, not to bring the community down, but I wanted to build up. I'm not saying that they all weren't, but when you bring drugs and violence into it, it changes, it changes the, uh, the motive. You know, I to humanize it a little bit, which is what we're trying to do here. Uh, from what I'm hearing on this panel, you know, I think sometimes people at home might think, oh, these, these are just kids who want to mess around. They just want to be punks. They're young and they just... But what I'm hearing is that it's, it's much more of a case of like, dire survival and choices are being made much deeper levels than just hanging out with their friends. Yeah, I'd like to address some of what you just said, too, as well. So the elements that were already discussed are definitely there. But also there's an element of mental health and also peer pressure. Because you do have individuals in the neighborhoods that come from two-parent homes. Sometimes they come from outside the neighborhood to come to the neighborhood to be a part of something that they think they should be a part of, the glorification of some of the things that are taking place and whatnot. There are many, many cases I can go into, you know, as an educator in Philadelphia, as well as a former football coach, where I've seen individuals, you know, reach out and even family members go and participate in things that they didn't have to choose, but then found out later on that there was some mental health issue or something that was lacking that just kind of drew them to that. And so they became part of those gangs or crimes and so on and so forth and whatnot. So just to bring that up as an element as well. Yeah, and also to basically segue into what Orlando said earlier, it seems like the theme is like belongness, you know, needing to feel like you're connected with someone. And that's basically the premise of us as human beings, you know, wanting that connectedness, wanting that someone that you feel like that can identify with what you're going through. Yeah. And, and another thing, the gang members are, never, are no different than the drug dealers, to a certain degree, or the person that's robbing or doing everything, because they're looking for a means and a way to come out the depths of what they're into or what they don't have, actually. And so if I'm hungry, if I don't have the shoes that this brother has here or the clothing and things, that, you know, because everybody wants to feel good in life. You know, one of the bad things about schools nowadays, way different. Kids talk, kids hurt kids nowadays, verbally. And so the kids laugh at kids who don't have the certain shoes, the clothing, or where they live at. And these things affect us because you always want to feel good. 
And so now, if I find a way to put the $200 sneakers on, I'm gonna do that. Might not be my best choice, but it's a choice that I think I need. And that's what happens in life. We, it's like sometimes we, it's the old saying, we, we, we don't do our best thinking, which we think is our best thinking. And I definitely can attest to that, you know. When I was um, robbing banks when I was growing up, you know, I thought that was my best thinking. Realized I was destroying my life. And so when I sit back and, and, and think about my life of spending over 36 years of my life and I'm 61 years old, incarcerated, how did this happen? When I came from a two-family household, my mother worked for General Motors, my father was an electrician, so it wasn't like we didn't have food in the refrigerator or our lights was cut off. I don't have that sad story. However, I tell my students that I work with, choices, decisions, and consequences. That is a formula that you're gonna have the rest of your life. And if you don't make the right choices and the right decisions, those consequences may not always be nice. Now, it doesn't mean those consequences have to define you because when I look at my life now, from spending 36 years of my life incarcerated, being released in 2018 and next year makes six years I've been home and the type of jobs that I've had, the type of, act, the type of events that I've been to, Lieutenant Governor with you, Attorney General, I would have never dreamed that. Down D Dover talking in front of legislators, down the University of Delaware talking to college kids, I would have never dreamed this. So my point is I'm not letting my past define my future. And that's what we have to do to our students. We have to let them know, okay, maybe it wasn't so great then. But it doesn't mean that this has to define you. But we have to get the information out there. We can't be afraid to get our hands dirty. And we got to be willing to love on our youth and love on our kids. That, that is sort of going right into our next point here, which is what are some of these interpersonal skills or community skills? What, what could we offer or what needs to be strengthened to be the balance against these luring decisions? I'm gonna take a stab at that. Um, entrepreneurial programs, and as you know this, you know, as educators, we're all educators in our various um, disciplines, but providing more entrepreneurial training, because a lot of the kids in the hood, they're smart. They just are using sometimes the wrong products, right, to come up on, you know what I mean? So teaching them, you know, good business skills, how to start businesses, so on and so forth, and also viable products that they can actually sell and earn a living from if they don't want to go to college. I mean, I've gone to college, got a couple of degrees, whatnot, but I would have loved to have went and got a trade or learned some other things as well. So, you know, teaching our kids how to work with their hands and, and sell things legitimately. Now, I will say the younger generation is doing a better job of that now, right, than it was when I was coming up. It was just, at that time, you know, the crack, you know, the hair and stuff like that, you know, and there were some other things out there, but it's more, than, but the, the digital space is a beautiful space that kids can actually earn income from. So I, teaching and promoting more of that, you know, and providing business models for students and for people that are just in the hood, um, I think it's one way to get them away from that thought of, I need to be a part of this gang, or I need to hustle, and so on and so forth. Hustle, but hustle something that's legitimate. We need to promote more of that. I just want to add something to what you're saying there, is that I think sometimes it's our collective low expectations mm. that are creating a low bar. And we, don't, we think people don't want to be involved. Or, 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 and so what I've learned when I'm working with uh, youth is that the higher you set the bar, they are hungry for leadership positions. They're hungry to be a part of this. I think we're writing off the youth a lot. And when I'm hearing what you're saying, maybe we could give them more entrepreneur type situations where we literally trust them and put the hands in their pockets. Sort of like the youth here who are filming Absolutely. here at the cause. Anyone else have any uh, suggestions on that? Well, I think that it would really be good for the community programs to make sure that the parents are involved in training and, and be able to identify when there's possibly something different going on with their student. Uh, does it look like drink? gang activity does what does it look like I think a lot of parents just don't know what to look for and and kind of like don't understand totally what gang is and how dangerous it is to to have your kids a part of it uh, that's also taking us funny into our next question but but I want to go back to a, connect something for a moment the shoes you know I think if you're listening and you're a youth you've heard it what are those you know, and, and that is when you're shaming someone over the brand of shoes that you're having. And I'm gonna argue that that doesn't just affect the kids, that affects the parents. Like, first of all, their emotional feeling that I'm not providing for my kid in a way that they can feel comfortable around their circles. 
but also financially, fe feeling the pressure to provide some, you know, 200 pair, 200 dollar pair of sneakers, as you said. Um, but now, when you're talking about parents need to be more aware of the signs of this stuff, what are other things that we can do to raise awareness, either to parents, to other youth, to, to the community? What, what are the best ways to raise awareness of gangs, gang violence, and, and this kind of? Well, basically, I think workshops, you know, anytime you offer like different workshops in, in different communities that are throughout the neighborhood, uh, I think most parents, I mean, they want their kids safe. The bottom line is they just want sometimes to know how to keep them safer. And if uh, community services can offer some type of group workshop for them, um, that's a step, I think, in the right direction. And a workshop that's that's not just a commercial, that's not being talked to, that's like you're working through stuff in live, in person with some other people. Correct. Uh, you're dealing with social behaviors, setting goals, all those things that kids needs to, need to know to be successful. Well, I also say, I totally agree with that, but then take that workshop and then cut it up into reels because everybody's in tune to their their phones and, and TikTok and things of that nature would not, and chop that up and send that out and advertise that through social media, as I'm sure you're all aware of. I'm Scott Michaels. You've been listening to Gang Culture, our first ever and hopefully not last live broadcast of this. Thanks for everyone who's been watching at home on YouTube. Thanks to our guests, all of the guests throughout the season. And uh, we'll see you next season. But remember, you are someone out there who has a jewel for someone. Take that. Take that responsibility serious, and let's help make a better world. Thanks again. Thank you so much for listening to Season 1 of Gang Culture. This show wouldn't have been possible without funding from the Department of Services for Children, Youth, and their families. Stay tuned for Season 2. It's coming out in 2025.